Hello there, my name is Eli Lukene, aka Lukene, and this is Intriguing Music, sharing your sounds. And today, we're going to have a great interview for a composer who has made music for all sorts of games, films, but especially for Crash Bandicoot and Jack and Daxter series. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you, Josh Mansell. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's really nice to be here. Thanks for having me. It's an honor <laughs> to have you here at Intriguing Music. So. Uh, before starting, could you briefly introduce you to people who might not know you? Uh, well, as you said in your intro, I'm the one who provided the original music for the first four Crash Bandicoot games and the first three Jack and Daxter games. Uh, that's pretty much what I'm known for. I've done some music for ch children's television that people might know. I don't know if it's gotten to Finland, but I did the music for Clifford the Big Red Dog, which is a PBS show, and I've scored films and commercials and all kinds of media so yeah a lot of experience in composing industry yes 25 years that's quite long that's quite long yeah. but hey uh, I have to say just one thing you mentioned uh, Crash Bandicoot and Jack and Daxter uh, <laughs> many many like me grew with the uh, whole series and uh, instead of me being whole fanboy towards all the music and all the things we're going to now focus on you know your career and ask how that has been uh, to you know our audience is uh, composers composers and they would be so intrigued to hear your story so that said how did you start composing at the first place well, I started composing in college uh, during my second year. Um, before that, in junior high school, high school, I was um, a performer. I was in the percussion section playing in the symphony bands and orchestras and the jazz band, and I had my own punk rock band. So I was came into college basically as a drummer who also had learned uh, some piano and guitar along the way. So my second year of college, I took a music composition class and I also took a music studio class, which introduced me to, um, you know, basically recording techniques and just, you know, studio type knowledge. So the combination of those two um, is kind of what led me on my path to becoming a professional composer. So I was encouraged by a couple of my teachers to uh, move to Los Angeles after graduating. And that's what I did. So uh, when was that? When was it? What was the year? Uh, I graduated in 1992, so 20, 25 years. I see, I see. And so you were originally a drummer. Yes, and I still play drums all the time. I, I play in two different bands, and I'm still very active behind the drums. So. I see, I see. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. Uh, so you said your your uh, teachers, they got you interested uh, and said you should do composing. Uh, but when you started making your own music, uh, what genres, what composers made inspired you to make music back in the day? Well, I have to say that like when I was in college and I was in one of my music classes, um, one of my teachers turned me on to this piece by Bella Bartok called The Miraculous Mandarin, which is actually music for a ballet. And I heard it and I was pretty blown away. And I'm a guy who listens to a lot of music. I grew up you know, listening to all kinds of punk, jazz, classic rock. So that had, a, that had a big effect to you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, but this is really the first piece of like, quote unquote, classical music that really kind of knocked me out. And um, I, I, um, I don't think I've ever written anything that approaches like the complexity of this particular piece, but it was a very powerful thing for me. And it got me excited about um, trying to, you know, write. You, you also have to remember that my uh, composing in college was mostly for uh, live instruments, you know, like smaller okay. ensembles. I, <clears throat> oh, I had done I some, some work in the studio, but mostly it was for, you know, uh, more standard, you know, acoustic instruments. I see. But when did you go to studio then? When you do really start making, you know, electronic, you know, composing with computer? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, after I, well, my last year of college, they brought in a computer to the music studio, so I feel I was exactly at the right age. If I had been a year older, I would have graduated with no uh, MIDI sequencing. I mean, I basically learned how to uh, record. My studio classes were basically, um, you know, working with reel-to-reel -reel tape, you know, like splicing tape and doing things very, very old school. But my last year of college, they brought in a computer and um, that's where I learned the basics of MIDI sequencing. 
And it was that knowledge that when I came to LA and I landed a job working at Mark Mothersbaugh's studio, that was the first question he asked me was, do you know how to do MIDI sequencing? And I was like, yes, I do. So, Oh, uh, so that was pretty significant. Absolutely. It was, yeah, that was it. Pretty good, pretty good. How did you get your first music opportunity back in the day? Well, before I graduated, I made a list of people in Hollywood that I could set up meetings with. And these were people that um, uh, my friends knew or I had relatives. And I basically made a list of people to meet with, like writers and directors and a couple composers. And I met with Mark Mothersbaugh, who's the lead singer of Devo. And he's also a very successful film TV com composer. Um, so I basically just called him up, talked to him, asked if I could come over and check out his studio. And I did that. And um, he said to keep in touch. And when I moved to LA, I followed up and called him a couple times. And by the end of that first summer in LA, I was um, working in the afternoons for him. And it just started from there. Um, I worked for Mark's studio for about 15 years. So. Oh, 15 years from that point on. I yes. see, I see. So, uh, just uh, one uh, side question connected to that. So, you said you made this list and contacted all these Hollywood people. So, uh, when looking at the composing job, do you think that one self-marketing is one part of the job? You know, getting yourself to all these projects and trying to find all these opportunities? Yeah, I mean, the, um, the name of the game is to build connections. And um, sometimes it comes in the form of a formal introduction, like, hey, um, you know, my cousin is working on this TV show. Do you want to like meet the producer? You know, if you're lucky enough to have that sort of in. Mm -hmm. um, and other times, exactly. um, especially in the freelance world, it's all about interacting with your peers. So if you're, you know, have a friend that's, you know, about to start working on a film, you, you know, you get excited about it and get inspired by what your peers are doing. And that's um, really the. Um, a good foundation for, for work is, is building personal relationships. All right. Do you know many composers of your age back then? By, or, no, or older or younger? Or how uh, you, did you have you know, experience uh, with composers, you know, friendship with com other composers? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Especially in, the, um, uh, in my electronic music class. You know, we were all kind of budding composers at that time. And, um, you know, I still talk to these people on a regular basis. So... It's it's good to um to have that network too. Even though you're competing for jobs, it's like it's better to like. <laughs> mm, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, I've been, I've been actually been up for a couple jobs against uh, some of my friends, and that's been oh, interesting. must have been intense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all good though. It's fine. Ah, okay, so you can still have <laughs> these relationships. Oh, nice. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, totally. pretty nice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, when you, you composed, made music for all these projects, but looking back at your early years, how long did it took to find your own style? Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I think that the idea of having a particular style doesn't quite always match up with being a media composer because you're really sort of trying to address the project and you're trying ah, to address yes script and characters and it's fine to bring your sensibilities which is what makes you appealing if so, you know if a producer or director likes your sensibility then that's how you get the job but once you get the job it's really kind of a fine line between making something memorable or signature and also really paying attention to the narrative of whatever the project is or the you know in, in the case of the video games you know, you're paying attention to the intensity of the gameplay, uh, what the environments look like visually. Um, you know, there's all kinds of information that you can look to when you're working on a project, and that's really what I'm inspired by, first and foremost. So the idea of having a personal style, you know, it's it changes. And all of my favorite composers are really good at maintaining something that's memorable and um, "Quote unquote signature, but also really appropriate for each project." I see. That I, make sense? Yeah, that, that makes sense. And and you are right, absolutely right. Many things are, and uh, sounds interesting. Uh, one thing you know, I just saw one uh, uh, before this interview. I was going through your SoundCloud works and you know saw some comments that oh, this was made like true Josh Mansell style. And you know, uh, even though you make a different kind of composition, do, do you think that uh, 
uh, still uh, you ma maintain the same same type of approach which can be you know uh, noticed when listening even though the different kind of genders different kind of worlds you can still perhaps see that yeah I can I can hear all kinds of similarities especially if you listen to uh, the music that I've done for commercials um, and especially if they were written around the same time period like you'll hear commercials that I wrote around the time of Crash Bandicoot that might use the mm. same instruments might have a similar if it's a, uh, a comedic commercial maybe there's a sensibility that's the same you know so you kind of you know it, it's possible to, to to kind of get into that mode where you're like thinking about say dramatic music a certain way or uh, humorous music a certain way and then you're sort of oh, yes. you know pulling in some similar you know because you're you're always thinking and working and and, and you know pushing music out so it makes sense to like um, kind of refine that within each project if that makes sense yeah that is that that, that, that is that makes sense that makes sense so uh but you you mentioned you know all these computers and uh, before you were you know uh, studying in college and music and stuff uh, the equipment must have been different referred to nowadays uh, what equipment did you use to make music and uh, which tools you use nowadays well, I would say the method is very, very similar, but the biggest difference is um, when I first started out, it was way more hardware-based. So I was accessing instrument sounds from MIDI sound modules, from sample CDs that I would load into a, a literally like a hardware sampler. Um, and nowadays, I'm still using a very similar MIDI sequencer, but my sounds are coming from a hard drive or from software synths or you know it's much more computer based so that's like the you know the main obvious difference between let's say 20th century and 21st century uh, music making in so, the it, so it was system based all these MIDI sounds and all the things you brought to you know to the system say it again they're what uh, so it was MIDI based MIDI based uh, oh yeah absolutely. absolutely I mean like I, I would like for the video game stuff I would uh, find myself in a place where maybe I couldn't find a certain instrument or I had an, uh, like a sound in my head so I would grab a guitar like um, I think in one of the Cortex themes there's a, a lap steel being played through a, a space echo and it just like that's what I heard in my head so I like it you know that kind of sample wasn't really available <laughs> uh, yeah so I grabbed a lap steel and a space echo and I just you know jammed out like a 30 or 40 different little sound bites and I chopped them up in little pieces and so I was able to like, you know, customize a lot of those sounds. I see, I see. Uh, just, uh, uh, did you, uh, uh, did you use mostly, you know, the, or MIDI sounds uh, which were, you know, in a hard drive or did you use, you know, did you record in real life uh, and put that, which you used the most? Okay, for the the video game stuff specifically, because I think, is this kind of what you want to focus on? Uh, as yeah, far yeah, as... no, uh, uh, yeah, in partly yes, but also, you know, of course, uh, because of video games, uh, it's not all of the things you have done, but uh, yeah, I think in that sense, uh, it should go by uh, which, you, which you use most, MIDI sounds or, you know, re recording certain sounds which you hear your head, uh, generally, to all of your songs. Are you talking about now or back then? Uh, <laughs> Mm, back then back then uh, well it would obviously depend on the uh, the project like I I remember doing a commercial for JC Penny where they wanted something to sound like a Perez Prada mambo and so I mocked it up using sounds and it sounded like a mock-up and um, the next day I was able to go through the the list of uh, instrumentalists and I was able to put together a little group to perform it so I think it was about five or six people and so the end product was all live instruments so that's one example because that's you know what that called for um, uh, it, it depends and, but, but it depends on the project you know, I worked on a, um, an, uh, an animated show where it was sort of jazz based and I didn't really have the budget or the time to track you know, a live drummer, a live bass player, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I basically did it all MIDI, but then I had enough time and computer space to hire a live bassist to come in every week. And he, you know, basically replaced all of my MIDI bass. And he really, I mean, that's something that I do a lot well, where, where I'll do a lot of the work in the computer. And then I find opportunities to like replace certain instruments that really breathe life into it, whether it's a violin 
or an upright bass or something that's very like organic sounding. Um, you know, a little goes a long way with that kind of thing. You and if you have the time and the money to like do all live instruments, then that's great. So, that's uh, so you prefer live organic instruments over computer ones? Well, I also like a lot of electronic music, and there's a lot of music that, you know, they don't have instruments for. So, I, I, I would say half and half, really, because I like I like crazy synthetic sounds too. <laughs> <laughs> it depends what the project must be. Yeah, absolutely. It all depends on the project. Oh, I What's see. Well, but by the way, when we we'll are talking about projects, uh, one big project which you mentioned, you know, working for Naughty Dog, making Crash Bandicoot music, making music for Jack and Daxter. How did you get involved to make music uh, for Naughty Dog? Okay, well, this was all done while I was at Mark Mother's Boss Studio. So he's the one that received the call from Universal initially in 1996. And they said, we are uh, going to be making this mascot based platformer basically um, and Sony was looking for something um, comparable to a Mario or a Sonic they needed like a signature mascot basically for PlayStation and Crash Bandicoot is what they came up with and I had just finished working on another video game my first video game that I worked on and because I had sort of gotten quite a bit of experience just working on that one game he thought that I would be a good fit to work on the Crash game. So that's kind of how it started. So he got the call. I was, you know, there and had just come off of working in a video game. And he was like, Josh, do you want to work on this? I was like, yes, I do. So <laughs> uh, how, did you, how, how did you make them feel, okay, this is the composer we need for Crash? Well, that's interesting. Um, uh, they gave us um, some visual material to work with. Um, there was another game that one of the producers had worked on that was kind of like a, a, a Crash-ish character, and it actually wasn't a whole lot. So I know that they, they wanted something that was like kind of cartoonish, and they also gave me a cassette from this band called Dead Can Dance, which is very un-video game-like. It's an 80s kind of ambient uh, band, and that was an interesting thing to hand me because it let me know that they were not uh, interested in a strictly um, chip tune type uh, soundtrack yeah, video type type of or atmospheric sounds which if you listen to the first crash soundtrack there's a lot of um, space in that there's a lot of ambient stuff to go along with the you know the drums and the marimbas and whatnot um, so that's kind of like that that was the information that was given to me and then I, I made four demos two of them very cartoony and the other two a little bit more ambient just to kind of cover all the things that they were looking for and they liked them so that was good and that was how i got off you know got got off the ground on that how, project, how so. long did it take to you get in into the uh, project how long did uh, it, how long did this phase when you had to you know convince them how long did it took well i if i remember correctly they were very interested i don't think we were demoing against any other composers as far as i know so I think the job was pretty much already ours based on... Uh, oh, I see. So it was a little bit different. I mean, a lot of, I'd say most of the projects now, it's like you really have to like, you, you know, you're competing basically. So you have to, um, you know, and a lot of times you have to, if they like your stuff, they might ask you to do some more stuff for free. <laughs> um, but this was a, a case where I think they, they trusted Mark to, um, you know, oversee the project and they liked his sensibility and um, the other thing that sort of made it a little bit easier for me to step in is that the Naughty Dog guys were all were all the same age, so you had this like per, you know uh, development you know, game developer where all of the employees are all you know in their mid to late twenties, and that's how old I was at the time. So it was um, there was a lot of trust built in that you know okay these are all like young smart people and we're gonna like let them run with it. Um, that doesn't mean that there wasn't any oversight from Universal or um, Sony, but um, you know I think there was a lot of trust, a lot of trust there. So, so this was the uh, we did this was then when you worked on uh, worked in Mutato Musica. Uh, is, is, oh yeah, correct. Absolutely, yeah. This is all Mutato based. How did you get into Mutato? Well, um, based on that um, that trip that I made to LA before I moved here, I got in touch with Mark Mothersbaugh and said. You know, basically, I'd love to come work with you. And he said, stay in touch. So I came out and called him and he said, keep in touch. And I was like, I, so I called him again. And then 
I ended up uh, becoming his, uh, I guess, like his assistant. I mean, there were only four of us working there out of his house. Um, so that was my foot in the door, was basically working as a, um, you know, an assistant. Yeah, Mutato is, is, is even today quite a big thing. So that was my, oh, that must have been yeah, great. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you had a lot of competition. Well, must, you, uh, you must have been having a lot of competition between all composers. You went to Mutato Musica, yes. There were many composers <laughs> there. So when you worked uh, worked there, were there, you know, this kind of competition, okay, this a new project is there, and uh, all these composers were looking at this uh, to get into the pro- project. Did uh, did the Mutato Musica have that kind of uh, atmosphere? So, or, uh, or not? I would say less so in the very beginning because there were really just, there were less of us. So it was Mark and myself and Mark's brother and a couple of guys who worked out of their own studios and everybody kind of had like specific strengths, you know, things that they were good at. And Mark was really good at, um, you know, kind of farming out the work based on people's strengths. So uh, the fact that I had worked on a video game, I don't. I, there was no competition at Mutato for me to land that game because I was the only guy there that had ever done a video game. So it was pretty simple. Now, um, as the years went on, um, there were you know more composers, and you know I think the only time where we really felt like we were competing in house was on commercials, and that was more of a result of commercials wanting to hear more and more music as demos, and just to farm it out to one person to like, you know, stay up all night doing 12 demos didn't make sense. So it was a, you know, it was a healthy atmosphere. And, you know, when a commercial would, uh, someone would call with a commercial, they would give us a creative brief. And then, you know, depending on who had time, you know, there would be up to, you know, three or four of us who would crank out, you know, a few demos each. And then we would end up submitting like 12 or 15 for each project. And, you know, I did a bunch and some of the guys I worked for did a bunch and it was, you know, pretty evenly distributed at the time. So. I see, I see. Uh, so you worked on Crash Bandicoot and uh, what were your thoughts when uh, Crash Bandicoot, uh, you know, it was a good big success back in the day. Even, you know, it, it is uh, it is even today Crash Bandicoot games are still made. Uh, you know, uh, how did it, how did that impact you? Well, I think at the very at the very beginning, we knew that it was going to be big because they basically told us this is going to be our our mascot game. So there was that was you know so we knew that they were, that Sony was going to get behind this um, because of what I just said. Um, now, as far as like the initial success of the first game, that was um, I don't think it was that surprising because you know we were looking at the game the whole time and thinking, wow, this is really amazing. I mean, it really the graphics were outstanding and. It was really fun to play, and it made sense that it was very successful. You got now, as far as, mm-hmm. yes. I was going to say, like as far as the lasting success of the game as a franchise, and the fact that we here we are, you know, 20 plus years later, that's amazing to me. Um, the fact that people still are very into it, um, and I didn't really start to uh, notice the the real long term staying power of Crash until maybe about. 10 years ago when, um, you know, I started uploading some of the music to SoundCloud and I, I got a very strong reaction. I was like, oh, this is like stayed with people and people like are very nostalgic. Yeah. And so that's, it's a big, that's nostalgia, I think takes about, you know, 10, 12 years to really uh, sink in for people. Does that make sense? Yes, it's yes, hard yes. To indeed. Nostalgic it's... about it just came out yesterday. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it is like that. It's like that. It 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 must. It kind of fades first, but then it rises back. It, exactly. Uh, we live uh, nowadays the time of nostalgia. All them, uh, all them films and things, all remade and stuff like that. But uh, we talk about Crash Bandicoot. So you knew that it was a big thing when it was made. So uh, when you worked with the Naughty Dog to make the soundtrack, uh, individual tracks even. How did you work? How did the work proceed? Well, um, I was basically working from a, a list of sorts where they were gonna like, okay, this, these are the different levels, the different missions, whatever you wanna call them. And so each one needed a theme and I just was very systematic about it. Could you, give, a, I, could, could you give an example of a list entry? Uh, I mean, 
for each game, they, they basically just gave me like a laundry list of like, okay, so we need like a snow snow level and we need Egypt or, you know, it's like they, and all of the names were very like on the nose. They weren't like saying, you know, the, I, I didn't even know what the names of these levels were until the games came out. So basically all my files are like snow, ruins, jungle one, jungle four, you know, it's like they're all, um, but that was enough to go on basically. And so I was um, lucky enough to work with a, uh, a dedicated producer from Naughty Dog, this uh, Dave Baggett. And we had a, a very close working relationship where he would come in on a weekly basis and listen to music that I was writing for whatever levels. And he was able to like take the music that I had written, play it for the Naughty Dog guys, and then come back to me with comments. So the whole like revision process and you know how the creative process unfolded was very smooth and um, orderly. Um, now, when we got into the Jack and Daxter games, I was not working with a, a dedicated producer, and that became a little bit more problematic because I would submit music, and then um, uh, just the process of getting feedback was a lot more um, chaotic. So. so he was not that experienced with, you know, providing me feedback to, towards you, perhaps. So, so, that, so you didn't perhaps had, uh, so uh, he didn't perhaps had. Uh, experience with you know co- working with a composer, so it, uh, the co- connection between uh, him and you was perhaps not that good. No, it was very good during the, the Crash games, but uh, then Jack, Jack uh, and Daxter, Jack and Daxter. Oh yeah, well he wasn't there. Let me be clear about that. He, this particular guy, he left after I think the third Crash game, um, and Naughty Dog was becoming a bigger company, and music just sort of you know, was a, a, a ship it lost at sea. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just, it, you know, when a company gets bigger, it's it's harder to, to rein it in and, and mix for it, you know, must it's a process. Be. Yeah, must be. Uh, circular type. But, um, do you, you had a lot of uh, creative freedom, it seems you had when you created the for Crash Games. Um, yeah, I think... Well, after I, I, I've said this in interviews before, but once I submitted the music for the Hog Wild level, that was a real breakthrough because it really resonated with everybody and everyone laughed and everyone thought, this is great, this is like what we're looking for. So, you know, all the ambient explorations were, you know, accepted and I think that they still hold up as being appropriate music for the levels. But that Hog Wild music is kind of what carried over into the other games. It's like a lot more fun, it's a lot more direct. But it also uses weird instruments too. It's not like you're just listening to like, you know, you're hearing like, you know, juice harps and uh, you know, like a, a weird horn section and a twangy guitar and like, you know, it's it's got its its weirdness in yeah. place. So. I remember it, uh, it from the last interview you had. I remember. So mm-hmm. uh, you worked on Crash Bandicoot. It went well. Uh, music was given, and then came. Time for Jack and Daxter. The same mm-hmm. type of, you know, game, uh, still bigger in scale, and you had uh, much more space, you know, for, you know, because uh, PS1, uh, PS1 had these limitations, then it came B- PS2, and um, in terms of audio, it was a step forward. Did you continue with the same working methods, which proved successful with Crash and Well, let me just say that the technology was a step up for the PS2, but as far as how music was handled, it was really the same method for the first two. So the, the first two Jack and Daxter games were made in exactly the same way with like, I was delivering MIDI sequences, not stereo mixes, but MIDI sequences with samples, one note samples for every instrument. Each one of those notes was down sampled to a very, you know, b- way low fi <laughs> um, and that's just the way that those games worked. And um, on the third game was the one where they said, okay, well, you can just do your own mixes and we'll you know, stream audio, which was a beautiful thing for me because it was really hard to like get certain things together in those Jack and Daxter soundtracks where they were sounding big and lush and epic. And I'm still having to work with like really short samples. And like, you know, so a lot of people call out, well, this sounds like crash music. It's like, well, yeah, it does because, <laughs> you know, there wasn't a lot of options as far as like, you know, building some really big mature score from like all these little bits and pieces. 
So when it came time for the third Jack and Daxter game, I felt like, okay, well now I can really kind of do hopefully what I thought they, you know, what I thought they were looking for all along, which is just a lot more, you know, just a, a wider screen sound, you know, bigger, bigger instruments and bigger emotions and all that. So. Oh, so the process was uh, different, and uh, uh, the music you made uh, also different for Jack and Daxter Three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you can hear quite quite a difference between. Yes, I mean, Jack Three was where things went a little bit darker, um, but Jack Three is where things, in my opinion, where it starts to sound a lot more cinematic and a lot more movie, you know, as opposed to the more kind of video game sounding stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes that sense. makes sense. Yeah. So, um, Jack and Dax, the games, the music you made, uh, the, you know, the, the fir- you know, uh, the first one, it has similarities uh, between, uh, you know, Crash and Bandicoot, but still, when it goes to uh, uh, Jack and Dax 2, it, uh, it, it, it starts to go a different route, but you still think it had the same kind of a mindset as uh, the Jack and Dax one? Yeah, I mean, I, I was in I was in a difficult spot on that particular game because they also wanted the music to be very interactive, so I had to compose in layers. Um, I, I actually wrote an article about the process of, of writing the Jack Two music, and it was it was really hard because they wanted something that was darker and more cinematic, and they also wanted the music to be very like. Uh, you know, like I said, interactive, mm-hmm. modular. You're hearing like you know certain instruments being triggered when certain things happen, and it was just um, it was very it was a challenging project. How did to it work go on. when you had you know these different mixes for okay, check turns a gun, then uh, another instrument came uh, comes to the uh, the song. How did that work? Did it take much longer than your you know the Jack and Daxter one, which had you know just I think one track per level? Uh, no, no, yeah. no, 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 I think, oh, oh, oh sorry, uh, mm, Jack and Daxter had these, you know, different areas kind of had the different instruments, but, yes. uh, but still, you know, Jack and Daxter 2, uh, it was a one step even forward, because when you did certain actions, even, it, it came, as you said, more interactive, so, uh, mm-hmm. it was more challenging, in a way. Well, the challenge was to find, I mean, all of the, the specific instruments that are triggered when certain things happen, like when you grab a weapon or hop on the hoverboard, um, all of those tracks are, are are playing throughout the piece, and they only become unmuted when the action is uh, triggered, basically. Yeah. So, you know, I, I had to write certain things that would would work at any point in the in the track. Do you know what I mean? So. Um, and that's why a lot of them are just a little bit, they're, they're, they lean on a more percussive thing because there wasn't really like... Yeah, melodies couldn't work that yeah, well. It was hard to, yeah, it's hard to address melodies in that way. And um, now, you know, obviously games have gotten a lot more sophisticated and the idea of like composing, you know, different stems for different scenarios. It's like, you know, that's a lot of people, but you know, at the time of Jack 2, it was like kind of a new thing to address. So there was a lot of... Um, Head scratching and trying to figure out. Well, okay, well, this works. This doesn't work. And um, anyway, so we did the best we could. Okay, so you work on that, and then uh, moved forward. But when you see your music enjoyed by thousands, I think if you make music for games, films, uh, what thoughts does that give to you? What's your question? Sorry. Oh, when you make mu- you know you make music and uh, you see uh, uh, fans and people and uh, talking about your music uh, in uh, in that scale, even though you uh, either if you do music for films, games, um, how does that affect you? You know, uh, to get heard and uh, does that uh, is that that you know? Yeah. What are your thoughts? Um, you mean when people are listening to your music and having an opinion yeah, about this is, it? Yeah, this is quite, uh, this is quite, you know, uh, a broad, broad question and, you know, going here and there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, when you, you know, get known for, okay, this is the uh, Crash Bandicoot composer, Jack and Dexter composer, oh, or this I, kind I, of... Uh, like after, yeah. after years have passed. Um, yeah. Well, it's very humbling. I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to, like, actually think back at that time, but, you know, um, there wasn't a lot of feedback about the music. I mean, there was feedback with from Naughty Dog, but as far as like, uh, once the games were released, um, 
the reviews didn't really say too much about the music. So it was kind of interesting to kind of look for that to like know what's being received positively or negatively. And um, it wasn't until a lot of, you know, a long time had passed that I started to hear from, you know, all of you guys who are like kids at the time who have grown up and, you know, so it's, um, it's been an interesting, there was kind of, you know, it was kind of a lapse, you know, and, and in fact, when I was done with the last Jack game, you know, I just didn't really, you know, the jobs were done and I was just like, all right, look, you know, what's next? I'm going to work on this movie or I'm going to work on this TV show or whatever. And it wasn't until, like I said before, like maybe over the last 10 years or so where, you know, a lot of the, the people come out of the woodwork and say like, oh, this is, you know, the soundtrack of my childhood. And I'm like, really? Oh, okay. It's, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's an honor, really. And it's a surprise. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about that when I was writing the music, like, oh, I'm going to be composing the music of, you know, that people are going to listen to over and over again. I mean, I, I knew it, you know, intellectually, but emotionally, I was just kind of like, oh, okay. This is going to have an impact, you know? So, anyway. I, I see, I see. Uh, just a one side question and then moving forward. Uh, did you enjoy playing those games? Are you a gamer? Can you consider yourself a gamer? No. <laughs> I mean, I was a gamer when I was a kid. You know, I had the, the home at Spring and I would go to, you know, video arcades and uh, pump the quarters into the, um, you know, the Tempest machine. Um, But yeah, I, I mean, I, I did play through the Crash games. Um, at first, it was really just to sort of get a handle on like how the sounds were coming through the TV speakers. Like I just wanted to hear like, mm -hmm. okay, well this, if you notice like the bass guitar sound is different on the first Crash game. And after that, it's more of a, uh, a picked bass, which, you know, projects a little bit more. But the bass on the first Crash game is like, ah, oh, this is like kind of, it's a little mushy. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, doesn't really like, doesn't have any teeth to it um, but you know once I started playing those games I found like oh this is great so I actually did play through the first three I don't think I played through all of crash team racing but definitely the first three crash games and I you know it's it's a lot of fun it's obviously you know your music so. there must have been fun um, you worked on films as well you prefer mm -hmm. composing uh, for films uh, above the games or You know, which medium, commercials, films, games, which one you did uh, find, you know, the closest for you? Um, I mean, each one has its, uh, its ups and downs. Um, I think probably working on films is the most satisfying because you can really sort of dig into um, themes and characters and plot lines and I know that that's all part of video game yes. work too but when I was working on the it, you know there's not a whole lot of like <laughs> plot going on in the crash I mean I know there is but it's not it's different yeah so I think I mean but what's fun about working on video games is that the music is really up front and gets to really drive drive the experience whereas like film music is a lot you know it's it's subtle or it can be subtle and Um, I don't know. I, I like it all. I mean, it's it's there's there's like I said, there's there's ups and downs to to both uh, to all mediums really. And working on commercials is great because you know it's usually like a really quick schedule, and you don't have to spend too much time on it, and you can say a lot in 30 seconds, and that's that's its own challenge, and it's th those mm. are fun too. So I see. So after the Crash game, you made music for the first time for uh, what's it? What is it called? Bone Water. At 1997, uh, can yeah. you can you tell something about that first film experience of yours? Long Water. That was my first feature, um, and it was an independent film, and it starred a lot of people who went on to do a lot more work. It had Jack Black and Luke Wilson and Alicia Witt and Brittany Murphy and Andy Dick and Jeremy Sisto and I'm sure I'm forgetting some people. Scott Kahn. Um, so, and once again, it was like basically a film made by a guy that I was the same age we were the same age and it was about people who were in you know in their late 20s and um, I think the biggest mis misconception about bong water is that it's like some sort of wacky stoner comedy because of the name and there's definitely like a, a stoner element to it but it's way more of like a um, like a slacker romantic comedy and it does have kind of an edge to it too so it's um, it's actually based on a book Um, but when people see that on my, my resume, they go, oh, it's like uh, half-baked or, um, you know, what's the Kumar, 
You know what I'm talking about? It's yeah. It's like stoner, wacky stoner movies. It's not not quite that. So, uh, but that was a, that was a fun fun experience because um, uh, the collaboration was good between the director and there was it was just the kind of music that they were looking for was totally something I was interested in, like kind of trashy guitars and noisy percussion, and um, you know it was a lot more kind of a guitar indie rock based score. So that was that was fun, Aww. especially stepping. Stuff. I think I did that maybe in between Crash 2 and Crash Warped. So that was a good kind of palate cleanser to like, you know, lay down some more indie rock kind of stuff. When you uh, when you made the music for that, was it uh, easier to go to other films after that, you know, the process and uh, so forth, to do more music for film, short films and etc.? Um, well, it's, you know, any experience that you that you gather kind of makes things easier but each film is also different it has requires different you know skill sets so yes and no I mean just the idea of scoring a film I, I don't remember how it felt back then but I'm sure I was probably a little bit intimidated you know it's like oh we're gonna work on a feature it's like oh but like I said it was a really positive experience working with the, the people in the film and they made it really comfortable and they were open to ideas and it was just it was really quite a positive experience. I see, so. I see. Uh, just, uh, I, I see also that you have made work for quite much for television. And uh, one of your projects, Clifford the Big Red Dog, uh, mm -hmm. has been nominated uh, for uh, uh, Emma Awards. Uh, so, can you tell something about that? Something about that TV project? Well, that was another Mutato project. And... Uh, the show is it's an animated show for little kids you know it's like a preschool show and it's based on a, a series of books um, that I actually grew up reading as a kid so I already had this like childhood connection um, and I remember when the call came in to Mutato and Mark was like oh there's a new PBS show and they want us to do demos it's for this show called Clifford the Red Dog or something like that and I was just like oh my god like, so I got really excited about it, and they didn't give us a whole lot of time to uh, to make demos for it, but um, what ended up being the theme song was actually something I had worked on that week for a, um, a telephone company commercial, and it was one of the rejected demos. I think I made about five or six demos for this, you know, Bell Telephone, Southern Bell Telephone commercial and it just had like a, a cool hook to it and it had like it, you know it's just kind of like this groovy little tune and so I spent a little bit of time with it and like came up with a more you know more structure and kind of shifted some things around and um, they ended up really liking it so it was just it was a really uh, to to get the job it was um, pretty immediate they you know they, they really liked that piece of music which ended up being the theme song so we got the job and then, you know, the rest of the series, which was, um, I think I did 65 episodes. So it was a big, a big order. Yeah, oh, it must have been, must have yep. been. So, so you, yeah. you talked about, uh, you know, the song was rejected and all. How much songs you make uh, actually, you know, you know, get into the project? Is it, is it a, is it a... Is it a, you know, I think in many interviews people don't ask this, but but it must be a real reality that some songs which uh, composers do don't get accepted to projects. So could you oh, share yeah. some light on that? Um, well, I mean, <laughs> the optimistic way of looking at that is like, oh, you're building up your library, which is mm -hmm. what you're doing. I mean, like that Clifford song is a perfect example. I mean, it was like literally just cast to the side. And I picked it up and I listened to it and I was like, you know what, this could be a really cool kids theme song. And it took like, I don't know, an hour's worth of work and I just knocked it around and kicked it back out and knocked it out of the park. So, um, but you're right. I mean, for each project, it, it is a process to, um, you know, you want to present a lot of different ideas at the beginning of a project. And sometimes the communication between, say, a director and a composer is not, you know, it can be a little bit vague or like, oh, we like you know, this score, or we like this song, or we like this sensibility, or in a best case scenario, they come to you and say like, we like the music that you did for this project, and then they're like, you know, you're, but that doesn't happen all the time. Um, but um, yeah, so at the beginning of a project, it's totally expected that you would come up with like a lot of different ideas to like get 
a dialogue going with whoever you're you're working with because it's you know it's a collaboration i mean you're you're being hired by someone but you are collaborating with someone so it is natural of a part of composing oh yeah absolutely all right so that, that you know, hearing about uh, how the process is going with your compositions and uh, uh, how did it go in the past, could you share some light on the future? Well, I'm working on an independent film right now, and I'm doing the music for it, and I'm also uh, building sounds. Uh, it's kind of a sci-fi thriller, and I'm building ambiences and pulses, and um, it's been pretty fun so far. And it actually... Uh, I haven't done like any real sound design work in a while, so it's fun to like really uh, get crazy. And I've set up, you know, like I've modified one of my bass guitars, and like I'm whacking it with mallets, and like really getting into like soundscape world, uh, which is a lot of fun. Um, and I'm also I, I'm, I have my band, and we were in the process of working on our second album, and I'm working on two other projects with other musicians. So it's it's kind of a a busy, busy time. Quite much work, and we are looking forward to hear more of your f songs in the future. So, <laughs> hey, uh, I think unfortunately this must be the end of the interview, but before we end each interview, we have this way of having a composer say this historical thing which uh, future generations will look upon and say, oh, that inspired me. So, uh, with that said, do you have any guiding words for composers having a dream to success? In the music industry. Wake up! <laughs> um, Don't quit your day job. I think it's, I, you know what? I think it's really important to, like you were saying, like come up with your own style. And I don't mean like something that's like so rigid that you are only writing in one particular style. But it's, I think it's uh, important to be to have that courage to not just like imitate what other composers are doing, or you know, it's, I mean, it's. It's good to like understand what the landscape is as far as what other people are doing. Um, but what's really going to get you noticed is if you're able to present something that's unique and interesting, because I think a lot of directors and writers and people who are creating film and games, um, they want to come up with something that people are going to remember and not just like have some sort of generic cookie cutter type thing. So, um, I, that would be my advice, you know, find your voice and, and cultivate it. That is quite something to think about. Josh Mansell, thank you for this interview. It was great to have you here. Thanks for having me, and I, I really like the way you roll your R's. It's very... <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a great to have a discussion, and, uh, you know, I wish you all the best for your future, all your future works, and uh, thank you for this interview. I think more, many of our uh, viewers which are, who are composers will find this interesting. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. <laughs> so, hey, uh, for, guys, uh, I recommend to sub uh, go to Josh Mansell's SoundCloud and have a look at all these songs he's uploaded there. Uh, many, many great songs, you know, uh, from the old games, Crash Bandicoot and Jack and Daxter, but also new ones for newest project. I recommend to have a look. And, uh, as always, intriguing music every week. New music interviews, videos and uh, tips for composers. I wish you a good day. Have a subscribe, like and so forth. Have a good day.